there's another a few other things like uh, brass juice is yeah. is a good cleaner uh, uh hornady sonic cleaner i mean there's a million out there mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people use yeah. different things a couple capfuls of goo and and water All right, what is up, everybody? Going to talk today about brass prep for reloading. Now, we've done a lot of podcasts on long range. We've done podcasts on on reloading, but we're really going to narrow it down to that, that brass prep, I guess, segment of the process, which there's actually several processes within the topic of brass prep, but that seems like a big component of... Of the entire, it seems like a lot of what you're doing in the reloading process, it all starts with that brass prep. Yeah, it's kind of the heart of it, really. Now, now let me ask, so to, to kind of go topic-wise, now you guys are way bigger reloaders. Who are these guys? You don't know? You forgot the intro. <laughs> For the Well, because you rushed me into it. Remember, remember when you rushed me into it? <laughs> I, I rushed a, you into it because we had, a, we had almost a, a full... Vortex Nation twenty minute. Uh, this isn't about twenty you. minute, ten across minute. Across the table from started. us, <laughs> across the table from us. If you're watching on YouTube, you may have already seen. You may recognize Jim. Please tell them who our guests are. Well, it's Scott we, and Tucker. It's Scott and Tucker. Scott already tried to break one of our cartridges as usual. Oh, let me see that. Let me break it. Uh, we did a whole podcast on annealing. We did, which we'll probably we'll probably get into a little bit here, but we're going to talk about a lot of the different stuff here. But uh, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for you. having us. And uh, Jim, shall we get started? I think so. Now that we've properly introduced them, well, thank you. You're you're all about uh, common courtesies. Uh, a lot of people not watching on YouTube, Mark. I know. Uh, we we have to be their eyes. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I I'm gonna I'm gonna break down kind of the brass prep steps, if you will, as I see them. Okay. You got to collect it. That's the first one, yep. You got to organize it. You got to clean it, anneal it, maybe, and then size it. Yes or no? Oh, yeah, I think you missed a few things. There's different variations to that, but that's definitely one way to do it. Okay. What would you guys say? So collecting it's universal. I think everybody's got to do that or buy it, but then you get to cheat a few steps. Uh I take it home and I actually anneal it first, uh, and when I'm actually annealing it, which is not every time. You haven't even cleaned it yet. No, I'm just throw it right on there. Are you barbarian. Bolt gun stuff, right? Stays pretty clean. Uh, a lot oh. of times there's a brass catcher, even if it's not like a match, um, right in the annealer, and then lube it, resize it. Uh, resizing, we can obviously get into. There's a lot of different theories on that. I think uh, different applications, so that that'll change a little bit. And then, uh, and, oh, actually, I lied. Yeah, resize it, trim it. And then uh, wash it. It's kind of my role. Washing it was the last thing. Washing it was the last thing. Well, if you don't, then you end up washing it twice a lot of times. So wash it fresh out of the gate. Then you're working with clean brass the whole time, but then you got to wash it again. You only really have that luxury with bolt gun and bolt gun brass. Yeah, correct. Gas gun, you have to do it. Mm Because gas gun brass just gets so nasty. It'll tear your dyes up. Yeah. You know. Um, Good to know. But, yeah, that's essentially what I do, except I don't anneal. Um, Whenever you what fifty five firings you said, <laughs> <laughs> Scott, you had some people I think tearing their hair out after that last annealing podcast. Oh yeah, is there right. some comments? I got to go back and look at. Uh, there was at least one, there was one or two. There always there's always one or two, but I yeah some people were. There might have been two teen though on that. <laughs> two teen. Yeah, <laughs> two teen of them. Um, okay, so let me go back. So you talked about you know buying your brass. So if if you have you know. Virgin brass, mm-hmm. virgin brass, as they say. What 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 do you get a skip there? It still has that patina on the. Uh, it's like it's it's been annealed, like all brass has been annealed, right? Mm, I don't think all brass. A well, lot, a lot of it. Well, anything that's yeah, any bottle in a case gets annealed. Any the bottle, neck. okay, yeah. Not not the six five BC, which we have some. That is an exception. That I was think. not annealed. Yeah, so not yeah. That was machine that's ma- turned turned brass. Apparently, didn't. Get annealed. Yeah, so kind of to your question, Mark, uh, new brass, uh, not all virgin brass is created equal, right? Kind of like we touched on. Like mm-hmm. there's some that are better than others. Some you may have to resize a little bit, size the neck, trim, uh, so you don't cut your bullet going in and start crimping the neck a little bit. Uh, but if it's a premium brass, generally I'll just 
throw powder in it, primer, and and seed it. Camper and, and mm. uh, it depends. Really? Yeah, mm. like a lot of the stuff I've been using recently is like Alpha Lapua. Um, you don't have to. Sometimes you have to though. It'll, you'll see it like snag a bullet yeah. on the way in and fold that lip over just a little yep. bit. So mm-hmm. yeah, F- for the for the person who's like, I'm gonna get into reloading like the basics i mean going back into it's like okay i gotta collect my brass right but like are there any things that you guys are doing any uh like you were talking about a brass catcher or are there things like do you have a process when you're shooting you're like well this is how i keep track of my brass or i make sure when i open the boat i grab every case and i put it in x thing to hold it organize it it's it's marked in some way are you guys doing anything you know, along those yeah. lines. And I guess we're speaking probably primarily bolt gun right now. Or Yeah, let's just kind of we'll operate under that main assumption. Yeah. yeah. So, and let me, let me preface this first. Like, there's going to be different ways. This is what we're saying his way or my way is definitely not, like, set in stone. You have to do it that way. Everybody finds the way they like to do it, what works for them, mm-hmm. you know? Um, there's going to be people that do a lot more steps than I do um, because – that's what works for them right Mm -hmm. um so generally what i do is i buy you know either 500 pieces or a thousand pieces of brass and i basically keep count on so in instance like if you had a case of lapua ammo right it Mm -hmm. all comes in 100 count boxes i mark those boxes one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and then i will usually go through and just prep it all so like it's ready to be loaded um and then i shoot that brass in order you keep them separate? round robin you keep the the boxes separate from each other yep wow even if it's the same lot huh um what do you mean well so like you order a thousand pieces of brass you mm-hmm. get 10 boxes usually yep. right and you number those even though they're the same lot you still keep 100 counts just be- because that's also my system of keeping track of how many firings it has okay on it. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So I don't want to. I don't want to shoot box one, box one and two before I uh, like twice before yeah. I've shot box three and yep, four. Yeah, you know I what gotcha. I mean. So I just go. I mean, it's easy to tell which which ones I'm using because those boxes are empty. Yeah, and I know. Yeah. I, I just need to go up to the next highest number next time. Yeah. Just kind of go down the line. Then. <laughs> yeah. Um. And now, like when Tucker was saying, you know, gather your brass, like. I, I, I'm pretty sure I can speak for him on this. He didn't mean like just grabbing any old brass off of the range, right? Because especially with bolt guns, it's, it's not real good practice to just grab any old brass off the range. You have no idea how many firings it's had on it. You have no idea if it's just a totally different size chamber that could cause issues. Like it's just not, it's not not a good thing to do no. in my mind. Hmm. Yeah, so that's how I keep track of it. Um, and the way it goes is essentially... I'll run through probably all thousand pieces of that, you know, like whether it's, you know, five, six, seven different matches. Um, and then once it's all dirty, then I go through and my process is to size it. Well, lube it, size it, tumble it, trim it. You trim it or no? Not probably not every time, huh? Not every time. So I, I will, when the brass is brand new, I'll champ for it. I very seldom have to trim. Um, after one fire, no. Well, even after a bunch, like with these cases that we're firing these days, like I, I just don't see a whole lot of growth. He's firing up the comment section again. <laughs> <laughs> there he goes. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't run things super hot either. Right. I don't either. Yeah. Like if you're running a, a super hot charge, you know, you, you're probably going to get a little more growth out of the case every time you size it. Um, yeah, I think, mm-hmm. I think so. Like where Scott and I are at and it probably started differently for him. I'm guessing like when you first started kind of getting into this, like the more you shoot, the more you try to refine the process, yeah. right? Cause it takes a long time. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of guys out there now using progressive presses and stuff like that to prep. Um, it's, well, it's no, just sad. faster. Uh, so one of the things like he was saying, he numbered the boxes, right? Each mm-hmm. hundred round box. So what I'll do is I'll get a lot of brass. Like I just got 2000 pieces. I'll, you know, Ooh. yeah, that was score by the way. Aristocrat. <laughs> <laughs> was hard to get so anyways i'll prime them all something you're planning for something uh, you just, should know about just to have it right because it's hard to get okay. um alpha gt brass is very hard to come by so i was fortunate to be able to get a bunch of it at once uh same lot 
right? So what I'll do is I'll put primers in all of those. And uh, as I load them, I'll then mark the bottom with like a color, like a Sharpie marker, a uh, Sharpie paint marker. And around the rim of the case, when they're, well, before I put them in like a matchbox or where I'm going to take, I'll put like black. And then I'll, I'll cycle through all of those pieces. Then I'll have a whole bunch of black ring cases and then I'll wash them all and I'll start the process over. And then the next will be a different color. In case there's some black left, I'll know that I mm-hmm. need to shoot those before the next kind of round comes into play. You know what I mean? Because you, you don't want, like like Scott was touching on, you don't want, like, a, a third firing brass and, like, a 12th firing brass to get mixed up. Right. And you just have issues down the line, right? So it's important to keep that separate, and however that works for the individual is probably the right way to do it. So mm-hmm. as long as you can keep track, firing count, I think, is really what it comes down to. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. We've used a few words along the way and I think we we've have. covered these uh in some other podcasts but you're talking about chamfering case growth and then Tucker you brought up washing. So what's going on? What are you doing when you're chamfering and why? And then let's talk about after that the the case growth, why it's growing and where it's growing sure. and maybe how you would measure to see if it did grow. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. So if if I were to to trim, my trimmer does chamfering and deburring and, and trimming all at once. So maybe, um, maybe explain what chamfering is for people that may not know. Right. So for, um, but the majority of time I'm not trimming, I'm just chamfering. And that's where you would use something like this little guy here. Okay. Right. So it's like a uh, bevel. It's a bevel. Bevel. Yeah. Like a little cone shaped looking thing. Yep. So it goes inside the neck of the case and yeah. that's going to get rid of any burrs yep. or imperfections something that's yeah. basically sharp and kind of going to get caught up on a right. bullet probably when you stick the bullet in there yeah in, in my instance what ends up happening is i stainless steel tumble and if i do it too long say i forget about it it'll actually roll the edges over hmm. of the of the neck and then that will end up catching the catching gotcha. the bullet scraping the bullet make it for a harder so seat. that was another topic I was going to bring up when you talked about washing was there's different ways to do it, right? The steel, the stainless steel, like he just spoke about is probably the best way to get your brass as clean as it is when you bought it. Uh, the downside is you will have that problem. So now I'm right. baffled. He doesn't trim every time and he's washing steel pins. But, um, cause I, I've refined my method over the years. Let's hear I don't know if it's time yet, but <laughs> let's mark like down. Sometimes <laughs> you're forgetting it. In the thing. <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. Cause, cause, refined. Cause, what's, what's that method? I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah. I'm, I'm curious so, at that as well. Yeah. So what I do now is I literally, I tumble for about three to five minutes and then I turn it off and let it soak. And then I'll tumble for 15 to 20 minutes and then it's done. And then you're done. Okay. And yeah. you let it soak in. It's uh, just water, soap, and uh, lemon shine. What's yeah, lemon called? shine. Lemon yeah, shine. there's there's another a few other things like uh, brass yeah. juice is yeah. is a good cleaner. Uh, uh, Hornady Sonic cleaner. I mean, there's a million out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people use yeah. different things. Couple capfuls of goo and and water. In the end, I really don't care. like like my brass isn't shiny. Yeah. When I do it that way, if I if I leave it in there for hours, forty minutes, it's shiny as can be. Right, but then but, you get beat up next every exactly. time. Exactly. Hmm. Okay, gotcha. so you have to whether the whether the cleaning process uh, messed up that well. Hey, you guys were saying that you cleaned last, right? That's where I'm getting confused. So, so if you're I, cleaning last, then are you also then having a chamfer again after you clean? What, that's where I, that's why I chamfer after that. So that's a different process, right? <laughs> so I, I used to do the pins and got tired of having to trim every single time. Um, and ended up going to a dry, like, media tumble, right? And and people are going to say, well, it gets stuck in the primer pocket, which is a problem. Yeah. Uh, there is a very fine corn, I don't know what the heck that stuff is, corn cob media or think, walnut. So, yeah, I think, it, well, I think there's walnut as well, but I think the stuff that I've seen are uh, the corn cob and then the stainless steel, and then you see the then, sonic cleaner type. Yep, yeah. and then so one of those types of media it has very small granules, and I haven't had much of an issue getting stuck in an empty primer pocket once you've deprimed and resized. So I'll do that at the end, and it actually polishes a little bit to put a little bit of slickness on there, so there's just less friction coming out of the magazine. It just helps a little bit, especially with other calibers, pistol and stuff like that, uh, where I'm not lubing the case. It then puts a polish on there, so it runs a little smoother in the auto drive uh, machine. Hmm. When are you guys uh, decapping? When, you, when are you When are you when removing? When I'm sizing. Personally, that's when same, I'm Same thing, yeah. When you're sizing. They don't yeah. do like two steps. Uh, resize Andy Prime, just all in one. Okay. And I'm trying to get into your order of operations Decapping here. being getting rid of the old primer. Correct. Yes. So, and you're doing that 
In the resizing die. In the resizing die. After, after I've annealed. After you've annealed and after you've cleaned. Nope. I don't no. clean until the end. Cleaning's at the end. For me. We're talking I, bolt guns here. Yeah, right. Yeah, if it's a gas gun, it goes right in the cleaner. I mean, gotcha. it just has to. It's disgusting. We didn't finish talking about the the trimming and the chamfering. And all yes. That. Oh yeah. Sorry. Right. So 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 Scott brought up one reason why you might need to chamfer. You get the 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 case neck is rolled in a little bit. That's something that would catch up on the bullet as you're trying to seat it. Um, there's also uh, you know other potential imperfections that could be there. So they there's usually like an inside and an outside one, right? Yeah. And you want to get. Uh, both sides nicely chamfered, so you just have a nice yeah. finish there right and at the mouth. I will say I'm I'm more concerned with the inside than my outside. I mean, the oh, outside yeah. has to be really bad to cause any problems. Yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, or if you over chamfer, sometimes you can actually flare that mouth out a little bit, and then when you go to try to chamber the bullet, it will it will catch a little bit. But obviously, you're not doing it too much or doing it just yeah. right. Um, just to touch on another thing is like when the cases are new, like Scott was talking about, sometimes they can just be a little sharp. Yeah. So that's another reason to chamfer when they're new. Okay. Yep. Got it. Now the trimming thing. Trimming. You're actually referring to when this happens because you got into the the growth of a case essentially sure. as you fire it. So in that case, you're actually essentially talking about taking back some of the neck. Correct. Uh, sort of bumping that back down because you're trying to get back to a certain specific dimension for uh, for the overall you know case length and all that stuff. Uh, and the growth occurs upon firing because... Well, it doesn't really happen during the firing. It happens during... There's... I guess, yes, there is. Okay, so you have the case that during the... If you fire it super hot, it may... The dimensions may expand out, okay. right? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's literally tens of thousands, if that. Depending on the chamber, right? Depending on the chamber, yeah. right? Um. And then also maybe if you have a loose chamber, you'd also have this happen. Sure. Um, what ends up happening is then when you go and size it and you squeeze all this, squeeze this metal back down, it only has one way to go. Oh, okay. So it ends up lengthening your neck. Oh, I, I didn't realize. Like, I always thought it was I'm, when it was being fired. That and happened. it might a little bit, uh, yeah. but both yeah. of those kind of yeah. factor in. But the resizing is really where you notice that growth. Hmm. It's yeah. almost like uh, maybe maybe the scissor isn't an accurate, exaggerated version. But like I said, you're resizing the brass, and you're kind of like compressing that lower end. Like you said, it's, it's only kind of got one way to go. It's like I picture like squeezing like a water balloon at the bottom. Same. Yep. And then like, bloop. Perfect. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so what I do to limit having to trim is I measure all of my chambers with a chamber gauge which consists of a, literally chopping off at least half of your neck and you get a, a caliber specific i don't know what the hell a tool called. scott it's yeah, a tool it's a, it's a tool basically <laughs> but it fits there you so go. it slides into the neck and it's the diameter of your chamber and you leave it at, sitting out long and you just chamber it and it pushes it in and you take it out and measure it so then you know you know what your maximum overall length of your case can be. And I just try to stay 10,000 short of that. So as long as I'm 10,000 short of that, I don't trim. Oh, okay. So you could have some variance between, but just as long as you're within like those yeah. guardrails, if you will. Yeah. yeah. Now, obviously you have a very specific cartridge overall length when everything's all loaded up and everything, right? Or is that With also the sort of... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that'd like be if different. your neck maybe varies just a hair, and you're at, like at least within your ten thousand kind of yeah. range, yeah. but yeah, you're remember. still going to have your cartridge overall length be the same in the end, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. So yeah. when your bullet length gets changed, you're actually changing like the the timing of when the bullet leaves the barrel and the harmonics and everything like that. That pertains directly to accuracy, so that's going to be crucial. Yeah. is getting that thing the same overall length. Uh, a lot of people get really caught up with trimming the exact same size every time, and there's really good trimmers out there now that do all three, like Scott was talking about, very fast. Uh, generally, the the Gerard and the Henderson Precision, I think, are like the best two for home. Yeah, I think. Is the Henderson Precision the red one? Yeah. That thing's I nice. Think it's bad. I just saw one. <laughs> <It's nice. laughs> I got one a couple years ago, and yeah. there's no going back. Let yeah. me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, the way it, the way it works is nice because the, cause the one I have, I mean, you end up getting blistered on your fingers that, you're after about 100 pieces your <laughs> fingers are smoked yeah. yeah so that henderson was the game changer and uh you know you're you're paying for it it is not cheap 
but uh, yeah, definitely worth the investment. Uh, the other way is, you know, the old hand crank, and you guys have probably seen those, oh, yeah. right? You just crank it, and then you get a flat surface, then you chamfer and deburr on something like we have here. Yep. Um, but so the Henderson or the Gerard both, yeah. and then you're done. Yeah. In about two seconds, you got the cut, you got the angles, and, and you got yeah. a clean piece of That brass. being said, if you're reloading a lot and you're trimming – with a hand trimmer, like, oh, please do yourself a favor and, and buy a machine to do it. Because it it's brutal. <laughs> it makes life – your your time is more valuable than that. I don't no care matter where you work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's certain there's certain things in life where you just should let the robots take over. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, probably should have covered this earlier on because I, I had it earlier on in my notes. But do you guys – like when you've got whether once fired, set two fires, whatever. Like, what's your what's your yes no for reloading a case? What are things that you're like, nope, you're out of here. Well, Scott just lets them go till they blow up. Um, okay, I, well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll cut them short of that. It's, generally, it's, it's or, blow or, it up, right? Not or if they don't, it. if they don't hold primers anymore, really, yeah, it's probably the biggest. That's thing the for most, most common. What I was going to say yeah. is like the primer pockets will get loose, um, or like when you resize it, sometimes you'll I see like relate. a little split. <laughs> You'll see a little split on the neck, right? If you see a little split on the neck after you're resizing, generally it's time for that lot, you know, no matter how big it is, to kind of say, okay. Or like, just that one. Yeah, so that's that's kind of what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? So generally, at premium brass, you can get upwards 20-plus firings. Yeah, okay. uh, I mean, I had a BR with, you know, 25, 30 firings, and, and I sold it to a buddy for almost nothing because he was asking for it, and he's still shooting it today. So, I mean, some, it depends on the pressure, how you load, and, uh, of course, your resizing process. If you're bumping the shoulders, like, way too much when you're resizing, uh, the brass isn't going to last quite as long. Uh, there's a lot that kind of goes into that. Hmm. Gotcha. What, what, are you, what are you using to uh – like to measure your brass to be like just be like okay I know I, I know my I want my brass length to be X and then I guess what are you using to measure that and then along with that like how are you measuring every piece of brass or like every no. fifth every no. ten so generally uh, and I don't know if you were getting ready to talk I don't want to talk over you there no go ahead okay so generally when I'm resizing brass um, I'm, I'm measuring the shoulders right because I, I want there to be just enough space in the chamber to where it'll feed reliably it won't be like a hard sticky bolt mm -hmm. and uh, the way you measure that's with a comparator tool I know Hornady sells a comparator kit with all different sizes uh, you pick then the size for the case you're using and they actually clip onto a pair of calipers. So you can actually measure the shoulder. And usually I'll measure four or five pieces of fired just right out of the gun, you know, once I'm in my garage or wherever. Mm -hmm. um, I'll get a good average, and then I'll get that resizer, or, you know, run it through the resized decapping die till I get roughly two thou of shoulder bump. Uh, three, like, at the very most. Otherwise, you're kind of overworking the brass. Okay. So, and then I'll, I'll run those four or five pieces, and once that's good, I, I just kind of set it and forget it. Is kind of how I do it. I'm, I'm Unless sure you get a hard cam over where you got like a yep. didn't get a good anneal or something. Yeah, but I'm sure that's pretty similar to kind of how you do it, right? Yeah, yeah. When you were talking about shoulder bump and all that stuff, and how you can bump a shoulder too much and and yep. things like that. Now, what are you referring to there? How do, how would that happen? So what what I'm referring to first is I'm just pushing the shoulders back down, and that that's happens in the resizing. Yeah. Guy. Yep. So. And you can measure it. Uh, usually, like the old school way was like run your shell plate to the top, screw your die down until it touches, and like back it up a quarter turn was like, okay, you're set. No, that's not. <laughs> that's yeah. like a general way to do it. Nine mil or straight wall, that's probably fine. Yeah. But uh, when you get into bottleneck and precision reloading, um, you just want to bump these shoulders about two thou down. And you can do that with yeah. just adjusting the die, you know, up or down inside the press. Now, just to clarify, uh, for the podcast he's saying bumping the shoulders but he is full link sizing he's not correct. just using a bump die correct which i'm i don't know which situation guys prefer that die and i would never use one personally just because of the style of shooting i do like i want a full link size every yeah. time yeah you'll get bench rest guys uh usually in a die set not usually but some of the time they'll come with a neck resizing die and a full body full length and then a cedar. Some guys will actually just resize the neck each time and maybe bump the shoulders. I don't think those even bump the shoulders. Well, there's there's there are some that neck, just bump or yeah, do both. Are, yeah. Yeah. So the problem you run into if you're you know running a mag fed gun shooting you know a good amount of uh, of rounds is then you'll start getting rounds that are really hard to feed. 
Uh, so for bench rest guys that are just loading one at a time, it's a little more common, I think, to do just neck resize. Yeah. And well, then those are the guys too who people talk about, you know, when they're like, oh yeah, they eject around at the bench and just kind of like stuff powder. Load and, it right you know, there. Like right there on the yeah. bench and stuff. Yep. And so their thing is like they want this brass to fit that chamber exactly. So there's no movement. Yeah. At all. Even though with 2000s, I mean, open your calibers 2000s and look through it. And I mean, you can barely, barely see through it. So it's a minute little bit just to help the overall feeding and cycling uh, of the gun and still getting, you know, premier accuracy out of that firearm. So, hmm. gotcha. Um, I'm going, I'm going to take a step back here and maybe there isn't a difference, but getting back into the different types of, um, which I guess maybe I shouldn't take a step back because it's actually a step forward because maybe in your guys' process, you haven't even done it yet. But getting back to the cleaning because I'm there <laughs> oh, right boy. now anyway. There he is. But is there a media that's faster? Like, I don't know. I'm always trying to expedite a process. You know, I don't, if I'm doing something I don't want to wait, like is the corn cob faster than the stainless versus like the, the ultrasonic cleaner that Hornady has? Or is it a horse apiece? At the end of the day, like you said, like Scott, you like the stainless steel, but then also you're kind of getting that, you know, turned in. Yeah, for me, I think I think stainless is is faster by far, mainly because it's mostly a hands off process. Whereas with corn cob media, um, you know, you kind of got to do yourself a favor and go through every case and make sure there's not media stuck in the primer hole, the flash hole, or the pocket. Do you check there's no pins stuck inside the case still? So that's the other side, right? So essentially. What I is after they're after I dry, you know, because if they're wet, then the pins will stick inside. Yeah, yeah. Um, essentially, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I exactly just, can cause them. I damage. literally, I as I'm gathering them, I just grab like a whole handful and put them all the same direction and just bang them on. So <laughs> same, same thing, right? You don't it, have to dig them out kinda, one by one yeah. if you mess up. But mm. and like in my experience, you, um, with pins, you can get those things squeaky shiny clean in about forty five minutes to an hour. It takes yeah. about seven, eight hours with any type of oh. media and yeah. polish, right? Okay. But like Scott was saying, like he's got a pretty good process, it sounds like, to keep kind of that fold from happening. Um, but it's yeah. It's clean enough. Yeah, yeah 100%. <laughs> yeah, cl- clean enough. I mean, you don't need them to be as good as new. But You leave those stainless pins in there, you got yourself a blunderbuss. You got a problem. Yeah, it's right. going to tear up that barrel. <laughs> No doubt. Old school. Yeah. <laughs> what we got around the house, stuff it down yeah. the barrel with some the other, <laughs> The other possible downside, and I've had this happen one time with stainless media, is um, thinking your cases were dry when they're not. Yeah, you, you get wet powder. With, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yep. That's with any wet tumble, too. I mean, there's there's different variations of wet tumbling. Um, but, yeah, you got to make sure they're dry or you get wet, sticky powder. That's not going to shoot. Nobody likes that. No. It'll shoot. The velocities are just It just different. goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had. Uh, Depends on how much water's in there. That's, yeah. Recently, this last fall, muzzle loading, my powder charge got compromised, and my bullet literally, like, is that why spit. You, is that from, why you missed? Yeah, it is why I missed. <laughs> sure, Mark. <laughs> I can I can guarantee <laughs> I can guarantee you that I wasn't aiming ten yards below the deer. At least it came at out a range of sixty yards. <laughs> <laughs> at least it came out because then you would have had a real problem in the field, well, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I am. I am glad it came out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was. Uh, so yeah, I, I I firsthand saw the result of when your powder gets wet. Why you let your powder get compromised? Huh. Why'd you let your powder get compromised? I didn't think that it was. I thought it was just fine. I've hunted like that many times. Yeah, that's a Mark, pretty common. you are the most like anal retentive person ever about your muzzle loaders. I know. Even though they I have stalagmites growing in the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> They're fine. <laughs> in the off season. We've lost a few good muzzle loaders. <laughs> <laughs> once the season mm-hmm. comes around and once it's about time to need to use them, you are absolutely a let's get back to, Let's get back to... <laughs> I don't know. I like that conversation. I liked, I liked where that was going. I'm a That's Jimmy. Just me. Um, so where are we at now? Where are we at? Now? I know I kind of t- made us take a step back there, but um, so now we've gone all we, over. We've, we've kind we've of we've sized jumped and around. cleaned, right? We've measured, we've measured, trimmed, trimmed, chamfered. Um, 
now they're ready to reload. Well, the dry, like the drying process is next in his in his form, right? And we kind of touched on it. It's got to be dry, but how do you get there? Yeah. Um, there's good air dryer. Uh, that's probably one way. I've never quite done that. That's back to like the manual trimming method, right? You're going to spend a long time probably doing that. Okay. Uh, they sell a little like food dehydrators. Oh, yeah. Um, is one way to do it. You know, 30, 40 bucks, a little Frankfurt Arsenal or, or something along those lines. Maybe I will get into reloading. I can make my beef jerky and so reload at the same time. That's where I was going was, you know, sometimes you have a few too many pieces of brass to fit in your dehydrator and I go steal a couple trays from the from the one in the house and I've definitely been in trouble for that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that's one way to do it. Other folks like put it on a cooking pan, stick it in the oven. I mean, there's multiple ways to do it. Um, but yeah, it's gotta be dry and that's definitely a step you don't want to yeah. miss. Mm-hmm. But yeah, after that, yeah. I think you're, you're pretty much good to go. Ideally, if I'm staying on top of things, I'm not tumbling right before I'm planning to reload. But so it's usually happened. The brass, but it's happened. Yeah, yes. I, it's happened to me too. <laughs> <laughs> you're like waiting for the rest to dry as you're kind of going starting on the others. Yeah, I've been yeah. there. I, I, hey, I got another question, uh, resizing question. Though. Mm-hmm. So when you're, when you're sizing, like how, okay, here's what's confusing to me. Reloading cartridges, like what we're talking about, we're talking about precision and thousands and things like that and then like when i see people adjusting their die it's like eh, eh. yeah that's kind of the way you have to do it guess and check guess yeah. and check and i like it kind of blows well, my mind that's not that's that's not necessarily either. okay so depends it they're i mean they're just threads so you can you can do the math and figure out how many thousands a quarter a turn is or an eighth of a turn is okay and you know. there are like wooden gunworks that makes really good dies, uh, and they on some of their resizing dies, you'll actually look at them. It's called the the click adjust resizing die, I believe. Okay, right. And it's got like a spiral up the threads to where each click is one thousandth. Oh, and then there's other forms of yeah, like there's, seating there's dies. Mi- there's micrometer with dies micrometers out there. on the top, but usually not for resizers though. Um, that, that I've oh, seen. yeah, that's seating. That's right. So that's the only yeah. uh, measured way to do it that I've ever seen. Um, okay. and, and they make a premium die. They also make custom dies. Like if you make a, a cartridge such as this, you can call them and be like, hey, here's here's what I need. And, and they'll do that. Um, the downside of that die, and I've had a few of them, is sometimes you don't really feel the clicks. Uh, they're they're very light. It's not like a turret, you know, easy okay. easy tactile. Uh, you kind of have to because that's really what I was picturing when you said, "Oh, it's got clicks." It, I'm like, "Oh yeah, I know. it's very similar." Um, it's just a lot less tactile click, and and to, to my experience, it's kind of the best one for measuring. Um, I'd be lying if I still haven't had to like guess and check a little bit. But uh-huh. you, the the longer you do it, the better you get at that too. Like you know about what ten thousands feels like. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, kind of trial and error, I guess. Yeah, I think. I'm pretty sure the Forrester dies and the instructions, they tell you um, like how many. Like a quarter turn equals or something right. like that. How, uh, how about like, okay, when you have reloaded and you go to the range, you're going to shoot and something goes quite not the way you planned. Mm-hmm. Where usually did you screw up? Was it in this process, or is it in the uh, the whole like primer powder seating a bullet pro- part? For me, I, I've had two instances. One is still a mystery. Mm-hmm. Two, I know exactly mysteries. what happened. Not many mysteries with you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the one that I know what I did on was um, I was messing with a cartridge. And I was using 4350 and H1000 trying to develop loads for it and and it accidentally mixed it up. Accidentally put the H1000 <laughs> load of 4350 in the case. Like, this thing's going nowhere. Yeah, it's like 107 at like 3430. <laughs> Whew, that's cooking. Yeah, it was cooking. That's cooking. <laughs> Um, didn't blow up though. I didn't actually, I, even the primer didn't even come out. Of the I was going to ask what your primer I was like then. Yeah, so it was pretty flat. I was going to say, it sounds like you found a really good load, Scott. Yeah, I don't know. Right. It's a, the, uh, the other one, um, was a different brand of powder that to this day I still have and can use it in other cartridges, but I tried it in a 243 Ackley. It was a beginning book load, uh, cause this was kind of early on had been reloading for probably two or three years at this point. And that thing just blew up. And I, to this day, I have gun? no idea why. Yeah, just it didn't blow the gun up. It just, I mean, I just got a face full of powder and soot and stuff. Blew the case but it actually, out or something. 
it the case became one with the bolt. Oh boy, you welded that thing. <laughs> okay. Did you put pistol powder in there or something? No. No, it definitely wasn't. I know exactly what powder it was. I mean, at that time, I only had, like, very little stuff, so it wasn't, like... And it was a rifle case. You couldn't, like, double charge it. Yeah. Yeah, it was a 243 Ackley. I've heard... You, you ever heard these rumors about, like, um, what do you call it? Something detonation where the where the primer... We have maybe too little powder, and the primer flash gets up above oh, and gets yeah. all the powder at yeah. once. Like when people are trying to make subsonic rounds out of something, and they, they yeah. don't put enough in there, and yeah. I yeah. think it was something like that. Um the funny thing was is um freak accident by the way that's not something that happens often yeah so don't no get it's too a nervous. weird weird deal um but it actually put i was on a surge in action and it put the uh so to this day i still have all these parts the the ejector spring is permanently collapsed wow the ejector actually poked a hole through the back in the case of the bolt oh wow so it's Jeez, like if you man. took the cocking pe- if you took the yeah, firing yeah, pin yeah. out you, you had get the two hole. holes in the <laughs> <bolt>. <laughs> <laughs> wow um yeah it was uh yeah right, right. It was interesting. That's wild. right yeah right before you said that story i was going to say it's fairly hard to catastrophically it is and that's just a, case a freak in a thing. rifle case and then <laughs> he said that like, well maybe i shouldn't say that so it's i mean you would have to really i was just going to say aside from something just i mean i, I don't yeah. know what the heck that could have been other than like having something in the case yeah. well, to like like make a smaller space with the same amount of pressure yeah, I, mean, I, I, don't I don't know what that could have been but what's what's interesting is like i don't know it's like two or three years later I was on AccurateShooter.com, uh, the forum, and I see this intriguing title of post, and it had something to do with this specific powder and a 243 Ackley. And I click on it, and the dude experienced the same exact thing I did. Wow. And so I, so I messaged him, and I'm like, hey, by chance, is that powder's lot number blah, 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 blah. And he texted and he messaged me back. He said, "Yes, it is." So I'm like, "Hot spot now." Interesting. So that that would probably explain it. But here's the thing: I've loaded in 300 Win Mag, tied a string to the trigger. I was about to say, (laughs) "Well, this this stuff blew me up once. Why not do it again in a a a 300 Win Mag?" (laughs) Oh, I have an idea. (laughs) And it was fine. Yeah, that that blew up. Sad more powder. (laughs) You're you're braver than I. I definitely would have chucked that. It was it was totally yeah, it was totally fine in the Win Mag. Weird. We'll tell you uh, how what, bizarre. That's, that's it's really don't, bizarre. Don't do that at home, people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, that's a Scott thing. So, <laughs> but basically, like, if you if you screw something up, what I you know what I was kind of getting at is if you really screw something up in the brass prep process, where is that then later on exposed? Is it exposed in the shooting, or is it mostly exposed and you're then trying to load primer powder bullet, and you're like, yeah, something's all screwy here. I think you maybe even said with your feeding, maybe sometimes you yep. might see some stuff. Yeah, there, there's a few issues. If, if you mess up the sizing process, feeding or chambering rounds is, is a big, you know, a, 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 yeah. whatever I'm trying You're not going to gonna see any major problems immediately, though. I yep. think that the biggest thing that you can mess up sizing is by oversizing repeatedly, and Just then you're going to start to run into case head separation. Yep, and then another mm-hmm. issue and something that we haven't touched on yet is a mandrel. Um a lot of people think strictly the amount of powder and the consistency of the measurement you put in there is strictly like that's how you control ESSD, extreme spread, standard deviation. A big part of that is neck tension. So mm-hmm. if you have inconsistent neck tension on the bullet, you're going to see those numbers spread. And if you're looking for precision, like that's what I would, that's what I would say go to um, if you have a half decent powder measure. Um, obviously there's powder measures out there now that you can get to the kernel accurate. So that's like a non-issue. And then really the next best thing is to make sure your neck sizing is good. And kind of what I do is I use the dies that I, that I was mentioning earlier. A lot of people will take the expander ball out of that die and then resize them all. And then they'll go through and mandrel the, the neck. Mm-hmm. And, and kind of what I touched on was like, we're trying to eliminate steps, right? Every time you got to run all that brass through that press again is daunting Mm -hmm. um so what i'll do is i'll I'll know my neck tension based on the bushing that's in the die and then i'll get the id out of the case and then i'll get the correct mandrel ball for that case so then it won't yank your resize back out if you have an expander ball that's too big for the 
the uh, bushing that's in the top of the die. As you come back around that mantle, you'll then un- unsize what you've just done. And oh. so it kind of kind of ruins where, where you were at, right? Mm. So you'll have more or typically less uh, neck tension. So if you can match that mandrel ball to the bushing you're using, which I know Widden, I'm sure Forrester, and a lot of other the, premium die brands. Yeah, generally I've found that the the Redding. So I, type I, S or whatever. Yeah, the, the Redding um, carbide balls, I usually buy those and yep. retrofit those. And, and they then, come with um, different sizes and all that. But they're the standard ones work pretty good because I think they – Anything that they're doing for precision stuff, they're basing it off of the premium brass. Yep, so which is like two thou under the whatever. Yeah. The so like is. if you buy a if you buy a six five forty seven die from Forrester, a full length die, non bushing, you got a pretty good chance that yep. if you're using Lapua brass, it's size in the neck it's about two thou. Yeah, and, okay. and it'll be pretty close. I mean, I got pretty anal about that a while back because everybody's telling me, oh, you got to manual your brass, you got to manual your which to me is a whole other step. And I've got one, say like I drop one on the floor and the neck gets dinged, I'll then drop that two thou uh, neck mantel through there, kind of straighten it back out. Mm-hmm. But yeah, ever since I've just matched the the, the bushing in the die to the to the expander ball and I've had no problems totally eliminating that entire step and still yep. getting you know and five it's, and it's even adding another step because you usually have to use some type of lube otherwise you start galling that's oh yeah right yeah, that's put a little I, graphite I, in there or something I hate having to use mandrels I avoid them just yep. because of that only right? for damage cases that's yeah. the only time yeah. and even then the expander ball you, unless it's I mean, if it's damaged that bad, I'm just tossing it. No, and just like <laughs> kinked over a little, right? Yeah. Like these things are a dollar twenty a piece. And I'm sure these are more than <laughs> that. On, but, Scott. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes well, Scott, even just new run cases. Until it blows up. Yeah, exactly. If it, if it blows up, just try it again, but in a bigger, in a in bigger, a bigger caliber. <laughs> um, so, what? what uh, one thing you mentioned? Sorry, Mark. But one thing you mentioned while we're still kind of on this topic, you guys have said before. It's happened in other podcasts. We talked about in reloading and all that stuff. I mean, high quality brass. Uh, La Pua, obviously, or, or sorry, somebody's probably going to be like, La it's, it's La Pua or yeah. whatever. But anyway, those guys, their name gets thrown around. There's other names that gets thrown around. Um, is it just the, uh, I, maybe we've even asked this question before. What is it about them? That's uh, so. Consistency is the big one, but it, it starts with like raw materials, right? It's just like when we're making scopes, we require a certain consistency and quality of aluminum before we're starting building scope tubes, right? Sa- same thing with brass. There's better and and less good uh, raw materials, right? So mm-hmm. when you're paying a dollar plus for one piece of brass, you're expecting a certain quality. Consistency across the lot is is the big one. Can somebody go through and use, you know, quote, lesser quality brass or cheaper stuff and still make it, you know, yep. work good? Yep. It just oh, yeah. won't last as long, generally. Uh, right. You just okay. won't get the length. And depending on the quality, you know, you may need to go through and sort by weight just to get yep. them or, halfway consistent. Yep. And, and some people it, will actually fill... Uh, the water in the case to measure the capacity, and that's like a step I will never do because it's too tedious. But <laughs> people do it, and yeah. so the cheaper brass you get, you may need to weight sort and or water weigh. Uh, I mean, so, I could see like maybe you could do like not all of them, but be like take ten randoms and be like, okay, you know, almost like find an SD of yeah your brass. So it seems like as with every hobby I've ever had. You can get by perfectly fine, uh, f- you know, physically speaking, by spending less money or doing something, you know, like the less expensive way doesn't necessarily mean worse, but oftentimes it means more time, more, more time. fiddling, more tedious yep. stuff you have to do to make it work. And then when you spend more money, sure, maybe you got your pinky in the air, but other people have saved you a lot of time by doing a lot of that stuff and making it good out of the gate for you. Yep. It's just mm-hmm. like working with cheap tools, right? Same, same thing. You buy a, a good drill once, like you're probably going to have it for a really long time. A cheaper drill, you may have to fiddle with it or buy more batteries, but it, it will do the job. So, yeah. At some level, you're going to get what you pay for. I mean, just with anything. You got yeah. you got to pay eventually. And it's just, if you don't have a lot of money, then just get used to paying with time. Right. If you don't have yep. a lot of time, get used to spending more money. That's yep. a good way to put it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, lube. Are you using case lube at any point oh, in the yeah. process? Yeah, okay, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, that's during the resizing. Yeah. Yep. Part. Yeah, right. Yeah. What do you like? I I was noticing, uh, Jim. You'll like this. Oh boy, we're not. This is gonna. We're gonna fire up that comment section again if we start talking about lanolin. <laughs> oh, lanolin. I love lanolin. Yes, that's, that's what, what I, like. I use too. Yeah. I, so. 
so we did the uh, the Rust podcast. Yeah, some people got upset because they were like, "This is a gun podcast," which we've never set, by the way. We've never played <laughs> that's true a gun podcast. Uh, I don't know. I don't one, know. Where... Uh, mechanic didn't like, and I respect his thoughts. He he didn't like the Lane Island because like, oh man, that's like makes his his job hard. Yeah, it's messy. Well, it's a mixture though, right? It's a uh, alcohol Lane Island and, and, and something else, and a lot of people mix it in their garage. Um, I think. You know, don't quote me on this for sure, but I believe Dylan, the, the pump bottle they sell, yeah. mm-hmm. is that same mixture. Frankfurt Arsenal has one, and it is hands down, in my opinion, the best. I haven't had a stuck case since I've been using it. Exactly. And I've had stuck cases using different types of lube, and those dyes are a couple hundred dollars a piece when you're buying a, a really uh, expensive yeah. premium dye, and it is a chore getting. <laughs> I them would out. say you don't want that to happen. No. I would say the only lube that I've had as good luck with as the lanolin. Is ten times slower, and it's and it's the wax, roll it. the roll on. Oh wax. yeah, that stuff's, that fantastic, stuff's fantastic too. But you got to put it on every but single you, piece yeah, by hand. Takes forever. Ooh, I imagine the <laughs> that land. sounds tedious. It's tedious. Oh, yeah. I imagine the lanolin stuff smelling quite good. <laughs> All of it, man. It smells like it? alcohol. Does it? Yeah. So it smells like a, rubbing alcohol. So it's a mix of lanolin and alcohol. Alcohol is what helps dry it and up water, quicker because it dries. Okay. Oh, and yeah. th- there's a mixture there. I'm not, I know alcohol is involved. I'm not sure the formula. I think there's a third. It's always part. involved, Tucker. <laughs> if alcohol is involved, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But any any of these lubes, if you use tune them in at, for the behind the scenes of the Vortex it. Nation podcast. If you use them in a closed environment with no ventilation, you're going to be feeling a little lightheaded. Okay. Regardless. That, that of, being said, that's a good tip. Yeah. I would recommend just buying it. It's not that expensive. I buy it lasts it too. a long time. It lasts forever. Like I mean, if you want to ex- do chemistry experiments in your garage, then you know that's on you. Feel I guess. free. But um, it's. It's yeah. not expensive. Three bottles for like 20 bucks, and that's good for me, which I shoot a lot for and I mean, yeah, a year or two. Like, oh, wow. I mean, a bottle, one bottle will generally last at least a year, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, depending, right? I don't know how much you I, use. I, I guess, like but. to soak mine pretty heavy because <laughs> I do not want those things stuck. Um, something to be said about that, too, depending on the on the dye you're using. Some dyes actually have vent holes in the top because it creates a hydraulic. I was going to say, yeah, if you really get it too wet, then yep. you're going to have hydraulics. Yeah. Well, down. I'll let I'll let it dry. Yeah, so I don't okay. I'll just put it in there soaking wet. But you'll notice some dyes will have that vent hole. So if it is wet, which sometimes it is, it'll, you know, you'll hear a little of air. Um, if you don't have that, you'll see, you know, kinks and stuff around your shoulder and body uh, junction. Yeah. So that's something to look out for. What's your process for applying? Uh, just put it in a bucket, <laughs> spray it, mix it up. And I just use nothing fancy. Yeah, I just use a round container with a lid. I put a couple spurts in there and just roll it around on the yeah, ground. Yeah, that's like pretty a much dog what I do. With a toy. Yeah, very Same. scientific. I actually, yeah. I feel like I'm right there with you. <laughs> I can picture it really well. Yeah, same. But you want to do it properly ventilated? Is that what you're saying? Yep. Uh, I mean, well, if you're making it, it, it may, oh, well, especially using that. It's not that bad. Well, okay. If you're using a lot of it, like I, I have a, a commercial machine for like pistol and two, two, three, like just uh-huh. fast stuff. And uh, sometimes you're spraying a lot of that and you will have, <laughs> you will oh, feel sure. some type of way when you're done, like a headache or dizzy. And uh, I've definitely been there. So now I'm in my basement, so I'm, I'm a little more careful. But before, when I lived in Florida, I would do it in the garage and just pop the door open. Okay. No gotcha. big deal. <laughs> I wish you lived up here. I'd be all right. I kind of well, miss if you start, it. If you start getting a headache, the key is to just keep to do more. That's what I've yeah. heard. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually, it'll pass. Right. Um, <laughs> this too shall pass. What about what about you brought up getting a case stuck? Yeah. I mean, what if you get a case stuck? Very common problem. And honestly, there's no good remedy. There yeah. are there are remedies, but no good ones. Yeah. There's there's not. Unfortunately, brass is even though. It holds onto that dye very well. The brass itself is pretty soft, so there's, it's hard to get stuff to grip it real well. I mean, like if you can get the if you can get the stem out, which is that, also a chore. Which is also a chore, What's depending on where it's stuck. So the thing the, with the expander that ball it, on it and the oh, decap, goes and down and the decapper. Yeah. Okay. So if you can get that out, um, then you're you definitely you know, one half the battle at that point. Yeah, some of these... Because then uh, you can just get a punch or something in there and just punch it out. Hopefully. Sometime, hopefully. Sometimes, sometimes the, the bottom will bust out. Yeah. I, think, <laughs> I think the best way I've seen, and I actually just saw a new version, uh, a completely different uh, system, but you need to get that stem. If you can't get it all the way out, you can still do the first method. Uh, you can get it halfway out, and you'll actually drill the primer pocket out, 
and then tap it. Tap it, yeah. And then you screw it in, and you use your press to then grab it and oh my gosh, kind of pull. I so mean, it's a, this brass is toast, no matter what. Oh like, yeah, no, you're losing the piece stuck, for sure. You're, it's done. Okay, yep. yeah. You're so done. there's another uh, version. It, it screws into the top of the press through the seven, eight, one inch or whatever it is, uh, the die threads, and it it'll. Uh, it kind of holds it, but the uh, the bottom of it slips into the shell holder, and then you crank on this with an Allen wrench, and it just clamps the hmm. the, the you know what out of the out of the dot the bottom. And then when you go up, you use it as a lever and pull. But I saw I saw I think it was Johnny's Reloading Bench, a very popular reloading podcast. That's good if anybody listening wants to get into this. Um, then you, you he had a like a four foot. Bar, bar on that thing it just snapped and off and then he had to redo his bench to hold the bench down <laughs> oh, <laughs> he's no. like Grr, pump but he got he got it out. i'd say probably you know four out of five he did get out with that thing so Jeez. he was permanently sticking cases just to see how it on worked. purpose yeah, yeah on pur- to, to try not, these not different methods Sorry. yeah correct i don't know why got the, that. got the case out he did need yeah. a new bench yep and that was a lot <laughs> quicker than the old drill and tap method yeah a lot less tools a lot less playing with the the stem and so there's a couple yeah. options out there but none of them are really good the moral of the story is either use a lanolin based um, lube. lube or a wax bait, you know, some of the wax case lube, and you should be fine. Because um, you don't want to stick, I mean, you can ruin the dye. Um, I mean, when you do stick a case, you're going to have to clean that dye pretty good with either some steel wool or something because there's going to be gold brass material stuck in the thing. Oh, sure. That's, mm-hmm. gonna, that's just going to build up. Explain more. galling if you can. To, essentially, it's just two metals getting locked together by friction. Yeah, just crudding up the internal smooth wall. I mean, usually, when those dyes are new, they're like pristine inside, mm-hmm. right? You don't want any lumps or, or galling or anything like that. It's just imperfections then in the wall of the case, yeah. which you can't get out if it's a brass uh, yeah. imperfection. I mean, it's essentially when a harder metal encounters a softer metal. Yeah or no? Yeah. I think it, just metal it's, on metal in general, huh? Generally, that se- that seems to be. I'm no metallurgy expert, right? But I think metallologist. Yeah, that's metallologist. <laughs> um, but I I think that's probably accurate because it's the only time I've ever seen it, right? Like when um, you know, screwing stainless steel barrels into a carbon action, car, uh, you know, carbon steel action, or titanium or something, or titanium yeah. exactly. You know, and I and I've seen you know lock up barrels if the threads are somewhat tight, um. Which sucks because you might not get that thing out without destroying the action. Talking real money then. Yeah. It's like I got really lucky. Real expensive <laughs> version of a stuck case. Or, <laughs> yeah, exactly. or I should say or I should say Jim C got really lucky. Well yep. I don't think he was charging me to chamber that, so I would have had a hard time having it replaced. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> Sounds like he's doing free chamber jobs. <laughs> Everybody, give uh, Jim C a call. <laughs> we'll put the uh, we'll put the number up at the end. There you um, go. Hey, Jim's not above standing on the corner giving out chamber jobs. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, glad you said that, Scott. Jim. You're the one that says no editing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> glad you said that. It's a family friendly podcast, and then and then we asked you to join. I got a question. Another sizing question. What happens if uh, you go too far? Like, hmm? you know what I mean? Yeah, like, it happens all the time. Uh, you mean like, so if you bump the what? shoulders too far or something like that? Yeah, can you get uh, it back? Or yep, just- if you shoot it. You have to shoot it to refire form the case to your chamber. Uh, that's the only way to get it back. Okay, Once it's but short, that would be within, that would be safe yeah, to do? I'll, oh, 100%. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of set that aside and shoot it in practice or just a range session, not with a match, because you will notice the SDES uh, variance at that point. But, yeah, not a huge deal, but I then don't put it in, like, my match okay. ammo box, right? Uh, there's just too much variable there. Not a lost cause, nope, but... no, nope, you just fire it again, and it'll reform that case. Anytime you, I think we touched on this on the annealing podcast as well. Um, anytime you shoot, right, the brass kind of conforms to your chamber, mm-hmm. and then it'll kind of have some spring back. Uh, so generally that will blow your shoulders out. Uh, that's like part of the fire forming process. I'm sure right. you've heard of that, right? Yeah. Like if you want to shoot a six dash or up until recently, there was no brass anywhere. You had to take a six BR case, either do like the oatmeal trick where they stuff gunpowder, oatmeal, and a primer, and they shoot it into the- Cream of wheat. Or cream of wheat. Yep, that's what it is. Oatmeal would be tricky. Yeah, a cream of wheat's what it is. <laughs> or you just buy like a cheap bullet. I like how he talked about the uh, 
the cream of wheat trick is something like you know the old that ah, old, yeah, the you old know, the cream one where of you're sticking a trick. primer powder and cream of wheat in your gun. <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> actually, actually, Tucker, I have I haven't heard about reloading cereal. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> so what it is, right? Say you've got a, a you six here. A, <laughs> Uh, you have like a six dasher gun or some other wildcat they don't make brass for. Okay. Uh, and you have its mother case, whatever that may be. In this case, six BR. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to put your primer, uh, your powder, and then you're going to put your cream of wheat in the top and to seal <laughs> you, it. You're, right? You actually, <laughs> this is real. 100%. It's the. Fill the, it's to fill the case up. Yes, to fill the yeah. case up and to seal it. So then you, just, you, then, you guys you just, realize how, how much it sounds like complete and utter BS, right? We're going to have to pull up the Google yeah, on right. the podcast. You can literally go to AccuracyShooter.com and yeah. Google cream of right. wheat. Or yeah. not Google, but all search right. cream of wheat and you'll find all yeah, Somebody's okay. rolling their eyes. Like, oh, so generally, uh, Jim, you idiot. <laughs> no, that's okay. Not a lot of people Everybody know about. knows about sticking cream of wheat in your gun. <laughs> I don't think you're in, you're uh, on your own on that one. Okay. So, but you, okay, so, so you, then you just shoot it. A lot of times they'll actually use pistol powder because it's really fast. Yeah. Um, okay. And then you just kind of shoot it. Anywhere, right? It's going to be loud, but it's not shooting a projectile. It's not that loud. Yeah, usually they'll like shoot it down gun. a hallway or something, and uh, then you'll get... You want to yeah. do it outside. It's messy. Uh, yep. I was going to say, and yeah, um, cream of wheat. Well, I was thinking like a garage, like out a window kind of... You're right, though. Definitely uh, outdoors is safe. But then you'll get about 90% fire formed, right? After that, you can then like shoot the case, load it as a dasher, and then you'll get those nice sharp corners that you're used to seeing in that next okay. shoulder junction. So that way you don't have to use bullets the whole time. I mean, they're expensive, yeah. especially now. Um, that it's just being said, like time fire, consuming. Fire, it's time consuming, and fire forming 6BR, the cartridge. Like it shoots just fine. It's great practice ammo. Yeah, but you got to have a false shoulder on that one, right? Yeah. So that's a little trickier with the feeding, but practice, yes. You What's could, a false you could shoulder? Um, so a lot of times with wildcats, you can just like load the bullets long, okay? Um, because what's happening? Because they now, gotta get they gotta get the two. shoulder has to get up to the chamber, now, right? Up to the the chamber shoulder, right? right? Um, so you need something to hold the case against the against the bolt. So when so the firing the, pin hits the hits the primer it doesn't, it doesn't just, just jump forward and not right. go off yeah mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. um so typically you want to use cream of a wheat. softer primer <laughs> softer primer <laughs> that's oh. two different methods jim oh okay <laughs> <laughs> um so what you do is so let's say if we're the 6br to dash or fire form um the first thing you would do is take a a six Let's see here. Yeah, like a 257 mandrel or a 65 mandrel and neck it up to 65 or 257, whichever you want to do. Gotcha. Then you will just size down the neck to 6 millimeter for your bullet, okay. but only part way to where the new shoulder is going to begin. So you'll see the neck oh. so now go that down. Jam, now that's right. what's oh. that becomes your your false shoulder that's what's holding the case in place oh okay it's almost it. like uh where your neck is just a little bit wider yeah it's you're gonna see it yep. go down and then it'll get a little bigger and then you're gonna go to your current shoulder right it's just enough to hold your case still so it doesn't slide forward in that chamber when you shoot yeah okay okay you know I mean? got it yeah and then yeah. the rest of it just balloons out into the yeah. you got it. the space it's basically it. you're basically shouldering up against where your neck is starting in the chamber I think that I, f- I don't know why I just w- I would do that way instead of the whole cream of wheat thing. It's a much better way to do it, in my opinion. Expensive. That's my it's just opinion. more expensive because you're shooting bullets. more bullets in right. order to get there. Yep. Well, either way, it sounded. Didn't you mention after you do the cream of wheat thing, you get? Still oh, you can shoot. shoot them then, but oh, you, yeah, okay. you can shoot them as good as as good as if it's rounded. You'll just have a slightly rounded corner, and uh, maybe we can find some pictures or something. Yeah, uh, it's a little inconsistent. Kind of explain too. it a little bit. But, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't take it to a match, but yeah, I mean yeah. they they shoot accurate. The numbers will be slightly different, like mm-hmm. a little bit worse. But so now the other method, which I for for six millimeters, I disagree with because I don't think there's there's not enough neck there's not enough neck diameter to cause enough friction uh, to hold the bullet hard enough in this process, and that's just jamming the bullet, just yeah. taking a six br case and loading the bullet long and just jamming it. The problem with that is, is no matter how much, even if you made this size this neck down to 223 and forced a 243 bullet into it there's just not enough circumference there's not enough bearing surface to hold that bullet tight enough to consistently keep 
the case from not jumping forward when the firing pin strikes the back of the case. Okay. So so if you if you take if you take ten cases that were fire formed with a false shoulder and ten cases that were fire formed by jamming the bullet, you can see where the old shoulder was mm-hmm. on the case. And on the the false shoulder cases, it'll be in the same exact spot on all ten cases. Where you with the jam ten cases, that line is just gonna be all over the map. Hmm. Because some of them jump forward a oh, little bit. Oh, okay. And they're getting it, some variance in how much yeah. they're moving. In the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And that will tighten up as you fire them a couple more times. Uh, but the, that also that's also a thing that leads to case head separation. Yeah. So the best, the, basically, the best thing to do is buy brass that already exists. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm glad that we got there. Because this is a process. <laughs> or as I like to say, buy them per twenty. Um, right. But. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad we're kind of wrap. We're bumping. We're at an hour right now. Uh, I'm kind of. I'm glad we're finishing kind of on this wildcat side of things because if you're watching on YouTube, the brass that's actually on the table is a wildcat. It's the six five BC. Jim, we just recorded a little six five BC update. We did ten minute talk. Uh, getting this bad boy spun up again for some more experimentation. And I, and one of the questions this might lead to a couple others, but. Going back to when we were talking about annealing, yeah, uh, and we've been looking at that amp annealer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now with this being kind of our own thing, one of one. Yeah. The amp annealer has the um, oh gosh, what's what's the word I'm looking for? Induction. Well, the induction, but like case uh, holder. Yeah, like there's not when looking at the list. There's a of, thing that goes into the amp annealer that's cartridge specific. Yes, you can prob. I would assume this they make a, a blank one that you can chamber yourselves. I would assume. Oh, like the insert inside the machine, not the thing you hold the the case. No, with. Oh, no. That's like a it's like. Uh, do you want, do you you want six millimeter? Do you want two forty three? Do you want six five? I'm like, no, I want a six five BC. Not on there. I know we have some pretty talented machinists here, oh. and somebody could probably knock that out for you. Um, or maybe you can call a place like Widen, uh, die, a place that does custom dyes, any place, and uh, and ask them as well. But I would imagine somebody here can probably handle that. We got some wizards back there, and, uh, and maybe they can too. Maybe they'd be like, "Oh yeah, we get wildcatters all the time. Yep. Send us send us a case, and we'll make one yeah. for you." I don't know. I mean, you'd think if people are getting amp and ears, they're probably nerd enough to be wildcat. A hundred percent. That's what I. That's kind of that's my hope. Right. That's my hope. So if you want, I can try to call a few folks, or if you guys want to as well, I just you know let me know. But yeah. that is the best annealer for the job, hands down, quality wise. It looks pretty cool. It is. You're going to yeah. lose one of your precious cases though, that's when all you right. test it. It seems you know we're talking just, about oh, yeah, saving that's right. time. We're just going to absolutely nuke it. Exactly. Yeah. Which actually, and we'll probably talk. about Do you about, think the six five BC just come can out, be it'll destroyed? It'll just come out pristine. It'll come, the amp annealer <laughs> is going to be like does not compute. <laughs> that, from another world. Yeah, that's what Ryan and I were joking about it. That that, that those cases might win. Yeah, <laughs> that would be funny. Uh, uh, we've defeated over, the annealer. Yeah. Over, um, overload the machine I, first time you try it. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, I can try to call a few buddies and, and get some information and, and reach out to you. But it is really cool seeing the vortex head stamp on the back of that. Yeah, I mean we're just. I mean this is Makes a super happy. fun project. We're just you know excited to fiddle with it, see where it goes. Oh yeah, we're doing it for fun. It'll be the best. <laughs> What's BC exactly. stamp? It'll, it'll. It's gonna. You know, it's, 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 gonna replace, it's gonna replace a lot of cartridges, Jim. Yeah. It's gonna basically put everything else out. <laughs> but no, we're just. It's like a fun thing. But totally it's totally fun, like though. pet just, project. Yeah. You know, just hobby. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we didn't name it the old bitch cat for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You're contradicting yourself. Awesome. Well, <laughs> I know we we kind of. I wouldn't consider this podcast a step-by-step, per se, because I feel like we kind of jumped back and forth a little bit, but I feel like we covered a lot of information about the different steps in brass prep. The uh, the deal with reloading is nobody's steps are going to be the same. I mean, Scott yeah. and I have both done this for a long time. I mean, I to my in my opinion, I've got, like, the best stuff money can buy to reload, and, and my steps are going to be a lot different than Scott's. Right. So we, we I think we covered the basis of yeah. kind of how it works. Just yeah, and I think actually the, what you said is probably a better way of saying what I was trying to say because there is, like, it's so interesting. Like, you guys, I, I consider you both, like, very well-versed in this, and there's still... You have different, you know, oh, yeah. different methods, which is yeah. pretty cool. And that's so. the thing. I mean, like even if you have, like if you had Ian Clement here, he has a totally different process oh, than yeah. both of us. It's going to yeah. be going to be different, you know. Um, 
I'm very loose, not very meticulous. Exactly. Oh no, it's not at all. Clem, yeah, he yeah. basically is, he's winging it <laughs> by the seat of his pants. <laughs> I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure he's designated a little spot over in the clean room, and he puts on his gets in the clean room, puts his gloves on. Right. <laughs> Pop yeah, sorry, Ian. he looks he looks like he's on the space station when he does his. <laughs> but cool, Jim. Any more questions from from your side of the table there? No, no. But I uh, always love hearing comments from folks, so yeah. can't wait for the comments on this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give us your comments. If you've got some cool tips, different things that you do that you found to be successful, let us know. It helps everybody. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Thanks joining for having us. us. It's always Thank you. fun. We'll see yeah. you again. Yeah. Until next time, everybody. We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks Bye. For listening. Cool. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.